uh, my um, application for a grant um, in, uh, in order to um, see what could be done. It, 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 is, it was the new Institute of New Economic Thinking to see what could be done to change the way economics was taught. And as a result of that, we, we set up two parallel ta task forces, um, one um, the, in the UK and the other under Perry Merling in, in Professor Merling in, in, in the States. And um, this is our joint report on what we've achieved. And we have done, so, we have made progress, and we have got, I think, the outlines of a, of a, of, of a, of a proposal which we're putting um, to this uh, session in order to elicit some good, good comments and criticisms, because it's a very, very difficult thing to start tinkering around with a discipline that has 250 years scientific development behind it, and, and yet which um, falls short in so many respects of what we need from economics in our view. So I'm going to start with the first slide. Um, I, I pressed something which should produce it. There we are. Um, so that's just um, the economics of the real world. But the important one is the Queen's question. I want to spend a, a, just a second on that, um, because um, uh, the first first um, 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 heading there is useful economics and um, uh, our aim has been to develop a more useful economics. The Queen's question for, 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 for people who are not aware of it was asked at the LSE in November 2008 on a visit and she said why, why didn't you tell us to group why didn't you uh, tell us um, that it was going to happen? Um, what was wrong with your predictive powers? Um, and anyway, that became the Queen's question, and it, 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 it gave rise to great discussion about what was right with economics, what was wrong with economics, why, 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 wasn't, why, why, was, why, why was it the wrong question, um, and so on. But anyway, the whole discussion uh, arose out of that, the discussion to have a more useful economics. And um, this, uh, we felt, when we started, uh, our task force started talking about this, um, uh, had to start at the level of undergraduate teaching. And the uh, f uh, uh, fundamental philosophy we adopted was one we called um, disciplined e eclecticism, uh, the, last, uh, the last line. Um, and the idea behind that was that economics is a discipline um, and it should not renounce its rigor. But there was no single theory of economic behavior uh, universally applicable. And um, so disciplined eclecticism seemed exactly right. Um, and the point is, I think, um, that economics consists of a logical uh, part and, uh, and another part, which one might say is based on vigilant observation. And uh, Keynes was not alone in finding first-rate economists rare, because although the logic came quite easily to them, uh, the vigilant observation was less, um, was less uh, often done. And I do think, actually, that people who become economists uh, do have a, 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 a peculiar delight in the logical parts of the subject and, um, and, and, uh, and, and in, in, in solving logical puzzles and in, 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 in creating logical structures. And that has sort of uh, biased the discipline. Well, let, let's go on to... Um, uh, um, the, 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 on the side of demand, I don't think we need to say very much. It is that there, there is a demand for, for changes in economics by, by the consumers of, of the subject. Um, and some of these figures are very striking. Something, a demand for something new, something that isn't um, uh, generally available, and that that demand uh, uh, started to become urgent in the, in the light of the economic um, uh, collapse. Uh, four. Um, uh, I think I want to emphasize the second point here, because I think we developed very quickly, our joint, joint groups, a common understanding of, of, of what the problems were, but on the other hand, um, we, we couldn't uh, have exactly the same uh, strategy for delivering them, for delivering the reforms, because the institutional structures in which economics are taught are very wide, widely differ. Not, not only between the UK and, and the United States, but also between uh, 
country. So the deliverable side of these principles is, is embedded in different types of economics courses and indeed in some non-economics courses, wider courses. And so that side of things had to be uh, a national. Um, now I turn to six. Uh, have I gone beyond six? Yes. Um, well, six really um, just uh, restates what one did, so I don't have to spend uh, very much time with that. Uh, again, emphasizing um, the, the, the limitation of the usefulness of the discipline at the moment, and I think the, fr the phrase stubborn unrealism was used um, quite often during our discussions. Um, Yes, yes, yes. Students are taught theories as uni universally applicable truths when in fact they aren't. What drives, what has driven um, the development of the discipline, especially in recent times? Because this is the big barrier we saw uh, uh, um, uh, ourselves faced with in, 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 in an effort to reform the syllabus. And um, I think all of these points are important. The desire by professional economists to reproduce themselves, um, the, uh, the, the uh, determination of, of, um, of, of, of graduate courses to have people um, equipped to do graduate courses when they come up from their undergraduate training. So I think the demands of the graduate courses drive a great deal of what's taught at the undergraduate level. And, 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 and you know, people did say, well, why aren't you tackling the graduate? level of the, of the subject, and, you, and we say, well, you've got to start from somewhere, and you can't do, can't do everything at the same time. And this is where perhaps um, one could um, uh, uh, more easily make innovations, though um, there is um, a, a lot of difficulty in doing that. Um, our solution, um, well, um, again, um, I think this echoes um, uh, something um, uh, Keynes said, I mean, I tend to cite Keynes a lot, not because of Keynes in theory, but because I think he was just um, so um, interesting about the state of economics. Um, and he once um, said, um, I hope that um, econom economists may one day become as useful as dentists. Uh, and, and I think um, uh, the, the, the other point here is seriously, um, to um, try and mitigate uh, the kind of ideological herd instinct of economists. What you, what you find is that irrespective of their particular, um, uh, um, particular theory, what, what, what happens is that like market analysts, they do tend to have quite strong ideological herd behavior so that, um, you know, um, if you ask why is there this stampede to austerity at the moment, you might say yes, of course, there's been massive pressure from markets, yes, there are big problems in financing government uh, spending, but also um, there is insufficient eclecticism of theory to stop the stampede in one direction in response to these other pressures. Um, I now turn to... Um, uh, have a look at this, which is, is this number uh, 10, yes. Um, this is a, a typical existing um, uh, uh, economics uh, uh, degree course in the United Kingdom with its um, ascending levels of macro, micro, and, and mathematics um, as, the, as the core. Uh, you um, uh, have no... Um, uh, in, 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 you have no compulsory history of economic thought anywhere. That's been eliminated. I think it exists as, as an option in one or two places. And only t in two of the 12 best universities uh, do you have um, compulsory economic history. So those, that bit of the subject has simply decayed and been eliminated as being uh, of no relevance. And we think that's a great mistake. And when, when, people, um, uh, when we ask students, uh, when surveys ask students, what do you want um, more from your economics course than you're now getting, they nearly always say economic history, more philosophy, some ethics. But economic history um, is, is very, very high up on their list of demands. And that is simply not being supplied. This is what our uh, new, new curriculum um, is, is going to look like. Um, uh, 
and you can see its replacements. We call it the INET curriculum. It is, of course, that is uh, in a way a misnomer because it hasn't been approved by INET. It's only, uh, it's only been, um, the task force has been financed by INET, but what INET thinks about it uh, will be a different matter. We, th we hope that some of these uh, uh, teaching tools we're, we're developing will be eventually licensed by INET in some way. Um, and, and offered and offered as teaching as uh, to, to universities to teach um, a radical yeah radical departure uh, I think that's um, more or less self-explanatory I just want to um, emphasize um, the last uh, the last um, uh, a sentence in, 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 on, on the right, at the bottom, majority that leaves academia and express economic ideas to, to lay audiences. You see, most of the people who, um, who, 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 who read economics don't become professional economists, or, or read some economics, do some economics. And therefore, they, um, they're, they're not, they're not um, uh, um, you know, then they're not people who we need to train to a level that is demanded by graduate courses, although that is the assumption that you go through this and you emerge at the end of the day as a professional economist. Most of them won't. What we want them to do is to understand economic arguments, to be able to e communicate economic reasoning, as, w as was once um, said by one of our people. We want them to be able to read the financial, uh, the op-ed uh, columns of the Financial Times with understanding. M maybe a, a modest ambition for a three-year course, but one that's often unfulfilled. Um, um, so um, we, uh, we now turn to, um, yes, the, 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 the core idea behind our ideal curriculum with competencies and depth model. Um, I've only got four more slides, and I've got 44 minutes remaining, I think, but that can't Some be right. Uh, so that is yes. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> um, here we go. Um, uh, UK curriculum overview. Now I want to just point out some um, uh, innovations here because although in some ways it is similar to um, what um, uh, the mod uh, con uh, 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 conventional curriculum looks like. It is, in fact, very different. The innovations here are, first of all, um, you know, if you take year one, all these um, uh, four courses are economics and the real world, basic concepts, basic tools, um, continuing debates, are meant to run together with each other and inform each other. They, 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 they should feed in. So the more theoretical bits should actually um, be embedded in, 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 in uh, um, the bits that deal with the, the, uh, the economics of the real world and continuing debates in economics and economic theories. We, we, got, we, we had some suggestive list of topics here which, which gives you some idea of what we want to talk about, introduce students to. Do we really need this much education? Huh. Um, why are some countries rich and others poor? Um, are the Chinese consuming too little or the Americans consuming too much? I mean, these are relevant, relevant questions to which we want to introduce students very early on in, in the economics of the real world, just to show that economics can be helpful and what its help can be in answering those questions. And then the other, the other um, um, thing in year one, continuing debates in economics and economic history. Again, we want to, we want to emphasize that there are no finished uh, finished um, theories, that theories change because circumstances change. And in that sense, the debates are interminable. Um, and, and, and also in, in the first year, we want to introduce um, uh, students under, in, in basic tools to uh, the use and misuse of quantitative techniques and give them some understanding of the philosophy of science and, and, and this, the extent to which economics fits the model of science, natural science, and the extent to which it doesn't. Um, and then we continue with, 
well, this is just a more, more elaborate, uh, more detailed um, prospectus of, of, of what I've just said. Uh, I emphasize mapping the economic landscape. This is uh, to give students a sense of comparative magnitudes um, and institutions. Um, so they don't use data in the abstract. They actually know what, what you know, GDP means and, 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 and you know, what, what, you know, how many billions um, uh, uh, of, of, of dollars um, uh, we're dealing with when we're talking about national economies, some, 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 something of that kind. Then under two, year two, um, this is more of a, uh, a conventional intermediate micro macro in econo econometrics. I just emphasize the language of economics and alternative approaches. Uh, <clears throat> I think there are two elements here. One is you've got, e economists have got to be able to communicate and not just a fellow economist. If they want to influence anything in the world, they've got to find a language in which they can talk to people who are not professional economists. And they've got, there are very, very few um, economists who are capable of communicating with wider audiences. You know, out of the thousands, maybe tens, twenties, hundreds of thousands of economists, you could almost name them on, on the fingers of a, of a hat in the English language. And that is a terrific defect of their training. Um, and um, uh, the ones who can communicate our economic ideas are treasures in the profession. Um, and, and, and somehow students have got to be able to, talk to, be able to do this and taught to do this and not just think that once they can um, express, draw a diagram or, or, or write down an equation, they have mastered the art of economics because economics is a persuasive discipline. And that's the second bit of it. It has its own language, its own particular forms of persuasion, which uh, again, need to be taught and mastered if people are going to be effective and useful. It's something Deirdre um, McCloskey's written about. She calls it the rhetoric of economics. Some people don't like that. We don't use that word. But anyway, it's a matter of how you persuade people uh, of your arguments and the validity of your arguments. And that's something that isn't taught. And obviously, it, m people should probably be given practice in writing essays which they're not at the moment. And um, uh, yes, again, here, what we're aiming to do is simply keep the real world constantly in front of the students as they end their, uh, as they end their course. And just a couple of, uh, one example of that. These are the kinds of things that um, we, we, we um, might uh, make available. Um, in, uh, in the options, I don't know, there, there are lots of them. They're purely, purely illustrative. Justification for bankers' bonuses. Uh, why did the Soviet Union collapse? The economic role of the state. Uh, um, you know, application of principal agent problem and the Great Recession and things of that kind. So uh, this is roughly it. Um, we have, um, we present this to you for your consideration, for your criticism, and, and if, if, you, if you so um, feel like it, for your support for the project in general and your suggestions of ways in which it could be improved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Um, I want to start with what I'll call our credo, we, what we called our credo. Task force members um, don't agree on everything. There's a lot of disagreement about tactics, and as Robert was saying, there are, there's, there's good reason for that because of national specificity. Um, but we did come to an agreement, I believe, on this as our credo. Okay, the central idea of our reform is to reconnect the teaching of economics with the workings of the actual economy and to begin that reconnection at the very beginning with the undergraduate curriculum. Um, the task force was, as Robert says, originally uh, his, his brainchild. Um, and the UK committee started with, because of that, with rather definite ideas about what the problem was and what needed to be done there. 
Um, by contrast, the U.S. committee um, didn't really have definite ideas about what needed to be, to be done, and so we took a bit longer um, to, to come to uh, our, our, our views. Um, and uh, let me just begin by foreshadowing four co concrete proposals for kinds of things that we're imagining uh, INET might want to spend money doing. Um, the, uh, the U.S. economics education system, just for those of you who aren't, didn't grow up in that system, um, the U.S. economics education system is quite different from the U.K. Students take courses in a wide variety of sequences, organizing their economics education around the rest of their college experience, including internships, semesters abroad, sports commitments, um, and the like. It's a modular system. This is the point. Um, and so it calls for a modular response, um, at least as a first step. And so what we've come up with in the U.S. side, okay, is a sort of modular strategy, intervention at various levels with various kinds of different kinds of products. Um, and these are the four, okay, general education, this is like the intro level course, and I'm going to give you more specificity uh, about this very short introduction idea, supplementary kinds of things. Um, these, uh, in, the, in the intermediate level courses, um, a kind of anthology we want to call the economic reasoning anthology, which is a different sort of thing than you might have, have seen before. And these case studies, I think, are, are key, and you'll see, you'll see why, because they connect the, to the INET uh, uh, virtual university strategy, which I'm going to come to. And the fourth is this field discourse anthology, again, a different kind of anthology than you might have, have, have seen before. I'll flesh these out um, in a minute. But I want to begin, we actually, in the U.S. Committee, because we didn't immediately know what, what the problem was, um, we had to talk a lot, okay, about about it. Um, what I'm going to present now is sort of, I mean, as chair of this, um, I had a responsibility to come up with something to say at the annual meeting. Um, and so the, this sort of theory of what the problem is and therefore that, that informs our solutions, I will take personal responsibility for um, and not implicate any of my task force members. Although, um, and I think we, it doesn't mean that our, our deliverables are necessarily uh, dependent on this um, either. Okay, so there are other theories of the problem that could lead to similar, uh, similar deliverables. Um, from the beginning, and I, I would like to emphasize this, that the thinking of the U.S. Committee has been shaped by the working assumption that things are the way they are for a reason. Um, for a historical reason, um, and they stay the way they are for another reason, uh, perhaps an institutional or a structural reason. We're not going to make much progress in changing things unless we identify these, these reasons. Um, put another way, our working assumption is that the current state of affairs, which Robert describes, um, is similar to the, in, in the U.S., is not just an error, okay? It's not a mistake, okay, that could be put right once you just point it out, okay? Um, nor, I think, is it the result of any plot. Um, there's no deliberate plan of obfuscation that requires a political battle uh, against the forces of obfuscation. So, so where did this current uh, state of affairs come from? This slide, uh, which perhaps I moved a little fast to get to, um, suggests one possible story, just to, to take you back in history, um, that informs my own thinking. Um, one origin of the present state of affairs is the rather dramatic reorientation of the field of economics that came about as a consequence of depression and world war. A reorientation that made an older pedagogy seem outdated and in need of reconstruction from the ground up. I'm taking Richard Ely um, as representative of the older tradition and Paul Samuelson as representative of the Reconstruction. The shift from Ely to Samuelson was, in the first place, a methodological shift, a shift from emphasis on historical institutional approach to an emphasis on the mathematical statistical approach. But what I want to emphasize about this is that it's not a shift from interpreting the world to changing it. Uh, uh, Ely was just as much a social reformer as, as Samuelson. Um, rather, it was about the conception of what kind of economy uh, we have, and therefore, what is the appropriate method to understand it and to guide reform efforts. Um, I don't mean this in any uh, deep philosophical way. Um, I just mean thinking about this from Samuelson's point of view. A previous generation had banged away using one approach, Okay. And the result was depression and war. It was time for a change. Maybe it was just as simple as that in, in 1948. Um, but what a change it was. You can see it simply by comparing the first page of the first chapter of the two textbooks, Ely and, and Samuelson. On the one hand, you have Ely's broad church in which, and here I quote, you're not going to be able to probably see this on the slide, but uh, all of these slides, by the way, and all of our work product is on the INET webpage now on the task force um, that you can have a look at uh, later, later on. 
Um, on the one hand, you have Ely's broad church in which, and I quote, opportunity is offered for exercise of every mental aptitude and every scientific method, okay? And he mentions there, I circle there, the, the, the historian, the politician, the mathematician, you know, there's room for everybody, okay, in Ely's conception of, of, of economics. On the other hand, you have Sh Samuelson's sharp focus on doing something concrete about the problems of unemployment and poverty, lest fascism gain a foothold. Um, in the event, Samuelson captured the spirit of the age and the post-war textbook market became populated by increasingly inferior imitators of Samuelson. Uh, fast forward to a, a few decades and to a new generation that absorbed the techniques and models, but without the post-depression uh, and post-war historical and cultural context that had informed Samuelson's own work and teaching. The consequent hollowing out of content produced a reaction, um, and uh, I guess we're part of that reaction, but it's been ongoing, and this is the point uh, I want to make in the next slide. Um, there's been a series of attempts to, in, to influence the direction of, of, of economics, um, official by the organs of the American Economic Association, but also individual, by individual professors trying to do their own uh, best uh, in, their own, in their own jobs. I guess I must be one of those uh, discontents since I was asked to lead the U.S. effort, um, uh, even though I have never myself tried to write a textbook. And so basically what I did was to recruit everybody who had tried to write a textbook to reform uh, uh, economics. And there, that's what made our task force, that's what made our, our technical uh, consultants panel. Um, and if you haven't been consulted, um, rest assured that we would like to consult you. So be, 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 be in touch. Um, in retrospect, I think one, one thing I would do differently if I was doing it again, um, I'm, because of the strategy of getting people who, who ha were, were uh, discontented teachers, it, it wound up that I was emphasizing liberal arts teachers, um, and that could be a bit confining. Um, if I had to do it over again, I think I would bring in more voices from business schools and even practitioners. The point being that practitioners and the educators who prepare them never could afford to lose contact with the real world. Um, they've been an important source of support from outside the liberal arts for reform within the liberal arts. And I, th I think we could use this in our reform efforts, and I particularly note there um, David Moss's uh, book, uh, which is uh, assigned at Harvard Business School and which sells quite well. Uh, so this brings me to my second question. Why, notwithstanding periodic reform efforts, does it stay the way it is? We talked about that a lot. Um, and, uh, and Robert had some suggestions there, but I'm going to go in a different direction. Um, the, the book that's been most influential for my own thinking about this is, is Louis Menon's book, which I'm showing here, which comes out of his experience trying to reform the general education requirements at Harvard College. Uh, it's, it's actually a beautiful book. Um, he's not an economist, um, and so he brings a wider perspective, reminding us that problems of curricular reform and resistance are everywhere, okay, not just in economics. I take away three points from Menon, which are important for this effort. Um, uh, what, 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 I, what I call the, the ideology of the liberal arts, okay? The, that, that the liberal arts education should not be vocational or, or, or professional. We're training thinkers, not employees. Uh, that we should be disinterested, the research that's done in these universities should be disinterested, neutral research for policy. It's the public interest, not sectional interest. Um, and third, socialization for citizenship, that that's what college is about. Um, it's our system, okay, that we're interested in, not some some other, and these, these became constraints, um, and each of them tied into the new economics that Samuelson was, was creating. Um, and one of the, the, the resistance to reform, I think, has taken these, these three particular directions because of those, uh, appeal to those ideologies, resistance to accounting, management, and finance. Many of these courses, certainly in my institution, are not economics courses. You can't take them for credit in economics. You can't learn accounting. You can't, uh, and, uh, uh, and I think it's, it's, true, it's true others. I think there's also the resistance to political economy, history, hermeneutical kinds of disciplines is, is an attempt to say this isn't about interpretation. There is facts of the matter here. It's neutral policy. Um, resistance to heterodoxy comes from this socialization uh, idea that, that Marx and socialists, this is somehow anti-American and, and maybe in political science or somewhere they can, they can learn this. Now, Having, so this is a sort of diagnosis that the liberal arts ideology um, has wound up uh, impoverishing economics education. Um, and, uh, but I want to emphasize that there's nothing in the liberal arts ideology that is necessarily at variance with the credo in my first slide. Nothing. The liberal arts can be an ally, okay, in a reform effort. 
and can be mobilized, um, I, I believe. In fact, I think there are good reasons to think that now is a particularly good time to mobilize uh, uh, that. Uh, opportunity is, is knocking. Um, we're at a time of change. What are these reasons why we might be more successful in reform than that slide I showed you of all of the people who had attempted to reform before? Three, three reasons. First, the world has changed. The end of the Cold War means that socialization for citizenship can relax a bit. Okay, uh, there, there is no socialist threat in the, in the, in the wings. Um, second, uh, the financial crisis has undermined resistance on the first two dimensions. Um, after all, it was a financial crisis. And as a consequence, there's a widespread sense that citizens, not just bond traders and accountants, okay, might need to know a little bit about accounting and finance, okay, in order to be responsible citizens. So we may be pushing on an open door, okay, in, the, in that regard. And, and thirdly, it was a crisis in economics, um, just as much as I think the Depression um, uh, was. And so perhaps once again, as in 1948, when Samuelson wrote his celebrated textbook, maybe it's just time for a change, and uh, it, it, the, winds, the winds are there. There's another wind of change in the air that the American Committee particularly wants to emphasize. We're keen on uh, technology. Um, and the internet and that, that sort of thing. Um, I'm certainly not one who thinks the internet will replace professors. I, I hope not, anyway. Um, but it will definitely change the way education is, is delivered. Um, technology is pushing curricular change anyway, um, and so now might be a favorable time to, uh, to use that push um, to make other kinds of changes as well. I, the, the example in my mind very much is what's happening to the, uh, the field of journalism, the way, the way newspapers are changing. Delivery of another kind of information and educational content is just completely transforming, it, transforming itself, and I think the educational industry is, 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 going, to, is going to follow. Um, let me give you two examples of what I, what I mean by technology, and here's the entertainment portion of the evening here. So here's a, a video that uh, one of our task force, is this, is this working here, is this running? There it is. This is showing the, the recession. You, you may, is, is, I see some of you recognize this. This went viral on the, on, on the web. You know, people, people loved this video, just showing the darkening. Is it, is it actually, oh, it's going a little slower. Okay, the, the, the way the recession developed getting darker and darker and darker and darker. The, 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 the uh, you know, this is visual representation of data that was impossible in 1948. You know, this, the ability to represent complex data um, in, in, in something that's just very compelling. And you, you, you ask yourself, where's New Hampshire there? It's, a, it's, it's actually, a, it's a little red there, okay? It's, it's better than the rest of the East Coast. Um, let me give you another example. So this is about, about empirical uh, visualization. Um, the second example is, in fact, from the Financial Times, which I, I love, as anyone who reads my blog knows. Um, but I also think the Financial Times has been very savvy about being. a transaction being where someone borrows at a here. low interest rate and invests in an asset that yields a higher rate. They're explaining the carry trade. I've used this in teaching. Between the two rates. A very simple example can show how profitable it can be. If you borrow a million dollars paying 1% interest and invest that sum in an asset paying 5% interest, you would earn $40,000 in a year without moving a muscle. The idea forms the basis of banking. It has also underpinned some currency trades over the past decade. So you know, when you know Japan this. This, had is, this is enough. Ordinarily okay. low interest rates compared to the, uh, can we, do I, will this move to the next slide? There we go. Um, the, uh, so these are two examples of kinds of things that statisticians on the one hand and journalists on the other hand are actually producing on their own, okay? We don't need to do this, okay? Other people are doing this, um, and we can easily incorporate stuff like this in our own, our, our own courses. So the challenge facing our, our committee um, is how to come up with ideas for something people are not already doing, okay? Projects that INET could could uh, support uh, itself and, or inspire others to under, undertake. Um, and that's what each of these uh, four proposals is, is about. I just remind you what the four are, and I'm now going to talk about each one. So the first idea is this thing called the very short introduction. Um, Oxford Press already produces a series of very short introductions. You see there's a, and there are a few with economic content. It's mostly actually other disciplines. Uh, you'll see there at the top of the stack, uh, uh, Skidelsky's very short introduction to, to Keynes. Um, in addition to the ones on the slide, Partha Dasgupta has one titled uh, Simply Economics, which Brad DeLong on um, our task force and Barry Eichengreen have used successfully in intro course at Berkeley. Um, our idea is to produce one on social accounting, 
So we're going to grasp the nettle, okay, and say accounting belongs in the intro course, actually, um, and, uh, and it's part of economics. Um, drawing on two historical models, which I'm showing there, the 1942 textbook of John Hicks called The Social Framework, which used the national income accounts as its architecture, um, and more to the U.S. interest, the 1952 monograph of Morris Copeland, a study of money flows in the United States, which is the origin of the flow of funds accounts. Um, our idea is that a short book like this could reconnect economics to the real world, but especially to the financial dimensions of the real world that are neglected by standard national income accounting um, and by the economics that got built on that framework. That's the first idea. Second idea. Instead of, or anyway in addition to, teaching students techniques of mathematical and statistical modeling, our idea is to provide examples of how ac economists actually reason in practice when they're talking uh, to each other or, or, or to the world. And our idea is to produce an anthology um, inspired by the Norton Anthology of English Literature, okay, that treats the writings of economists as texts, to be studied as texts. Um, how does this text work? That's what the budding student of literature is asked and, 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 and studies. And the same question could offer a way into the field of economics. Um, this list of seven are, are really an attempt to categorize different kinds of texts. We classify by kinds, the functions of the texts, not by the author, academic, practitioner, journalist uh, type. Uh, that's important. Third idea. This, idea, this is a web idea, okay? So this is our thought about how we could be like the FT in innovating and using, and using, and using the web. Um, our inspiration is a page that's already on the INET website that was produced early on in the life of that organization, um, last August 2010. It was an experiment at the time, uh, apparently a one-off, produced for an audience that was not yet well-defined or even hardly existed at that time, it was building out this organization. In retrospect, it seems to us really a remarkably successful experiment, showing a new kind of product that could have far-reaching curricular impact. Um, I'm showing there on the right-hand side. Um, how does this text work, we could ask? Okay. First of all, it gathers together in one place various internal INET video assets from conferences and interviews, links to external assets from various, of various kinds, um, but that's not the value added. Anyone could put together a list like that from a Google search, okay? Uh, anyone, I mean, less aged than me. Um, the, the real value added in this kind of web page here adds, uh, adds in, uh, is, is the text that surrounds these materials. Text that puts these things in context with one another and the larger issues being addressed, and text that guides the reader into engagement with the materials uh, by raising a series of guide questions. If you, if you go on the web page and you page down, you'll see all, all, of, that, all of that stuff. Um, that's what professors do in their classes, and it's what INET can do on the website. But for me, the element that makes the whole thing pop, okay, is what, uh, what I, I come to call the impact video. In this case, it's a video that INET played no role in producing. Austerity, it's big in Europe. It's getting big here. Everyone in the prime minister has been talking about it. But what is it? It's the common sense on how to pay for the massive increase in public debt caused by the financial crisis, mostly through the slashing of government services. First you take on debt, then you pay it off. So I'll just stop it there. The, uh, this is a video that INET played no role in producing. Mark Blythe, who's, who's the speaker there, um, told me the story of how it came to be as a collaboration between, it was an invention, okay, between him and a videographer animator. Um, the point is that this little video Okay, that he produced uh, uh, went viral. Okay, it's had hundreds of thousands of hits all over all, all, all over the web. So one, so here's our idea that INET could go in the business of producing things like this. Okay, that would be the impact video that would give the pop that would guide people then to the website that has has all the rest of the content on it. Oh no, I don't want to see it again. Okay, here's the fourth idea. Um, uh, this example is from my own course, um, Economics of Money and Banking, which I've taught at Columbia uh, and Barnard for 10 years, and most recently also at Boston University. Um, and, but I think it's an idea that could be a, a wi more widely used, but I'm just going to give you the example of, of, of what I do. Um, I am showing, I use Stigham's Money Markets as a text for the course, um, but the book is a, really a desk reference for people who work in the money markets. So the real text is my lectures, and this is the important point, this series of 12 weekly readings. Choose these readings as a way, uh, they're, they're texts that, that are, are uh, ways of introducing students, <clears throat> excuse me, 
to the range of voices um, and the kinds of different kinds of people who are attempting to reason economically about some dimension of how the money markets work. So here's a, so one idea is to give a voice to people who are not professors, who are non-academic. Non so I always have texts that are people who've written from the Fed, people who've written from the BIS, um, and, and Wall Street practitioners. Um, this is the famous uh, shadow banking piece which uh, uh, from, the, from the New York Fed. Um, and uh, oh, some of this li lining up didn't work when it got translated. Okay, there were, there were things underlined and now they're overlined. Oh, okay, but you, you, but you, see, you, see, the, you see the point. Um, the, another dimension in which that you can use this anthology for is to emphasize the historical and, and uh, character and institutional character. So I always choose some texts there you can see uh, that are, are older. The chapters by Dunbar are actually textbook chapters about how the checking system worked before there was even the Fed. Um, it actually is very, students just love this because it's very pedagogical, but it also definitely tells you there was a world before a central bank. How about that? Uh, and, uh, and finally, also some of these uh, uh, new economic thinking, okay, and I'm showing here Minsky um, and, and Hicks, his beautiful uh, book, uh, Market Theory of, of Money. Um, and uh, in, order to, in order to foster some, some discussion. So, so these four ideas are four concrete examples of deliverables that we could start producing tomorrow. Um, the idea that these might be a good place to start from comes, uh, in my mind, from the analysis of the problem, but it could, they could come from other an analyses of the problem as well. Um, and these deliverables, and here's what I want to use the last slide or two to say, are, are really only a place to start. Um, they're not a place to finish. Um, in his charge to the committee, when, when Rob Johnson came to talk to us, he urged us to think big. Okay, and we were all very much energized by this charge, and so there's something a little embarrassingly small about these four little ideas here. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we're uh, not thinking big. Okay, um, so very much in our mind is the problem of getting these new materials adopted and taught um, by actual economists who are actually teaching in actual departments. Um, and uh, they're all designed to be attractive. I think we can make them attractive, low cost, easy to adopt, high quality. Um, but in the longer run, the task is gonna be about teaching the teacher um, as, much as, as much as the student. Um, and so I wanna draw attention to ways in which our efforts are linking up with other efforts that INET is already uh, undergoing here. The History of Economic Thought Task Force, which is trying to uh, 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 broaden the scope of, of what people are able to teach, um, and the Economic History Task Force um, as well um, out, of, out, of, out of Berkeley. Um, we see our curricular efforts as linking up quite closely with, with those efforts. Um, further, and here's where we see ourselves focusing maybe for the year ahead, our discussions so far have been focused on the UK, the UK committee and, and, and the US, that there's a whole world out there. Um, now there's good reason for that narrow focus. The whole world out there is mainly adopting inferior copies of correct curricular materials produced in the US and the UK. Um, but we don't want the rest of the world to be adopting inferior copies of the curricular materials that we produce, okay? Um, in the next stage of our work, we need to bring these additional perspectives uh, into the tent by coming up with content and delivery strategies that make sense for these markets uh, as, as a whole. Last slide. So looking ahead, as INET builds out the vision of a virtual university, um, we look forward to continuing involvement in the curricular dimension of that vision. Um, and I'm ending here with an advertisement for INET's beautiful new website, uh, where the first green shoots of that vision are, are sprouting, uh, spring image. Um, if you've been visiting our site regularly, you know we now have a weekly director's uh, interview series, uh, which is sort of like a pu our, our public lecture. Uh, series uh, that are offered at bricks and mortar universities. Uh, there's uh, my little blog, but there's going to be lots of them. That's our, our, our idea, and some of our new bloggers are here. You may have, you, you may have met them. Um, and, uh, and then I, I point again to this impact issues modules. Um, if this idea catches fire, um, we could have a lot of them. We have only one right now. Uh, it could be a series. Stay tuned. Thank you.
I, I want to um, yeah. repair an unpardonable omission on my part, yeah. which is that I didn't introduce members of our task force who are here. Yes, that's a good idea. I mean, um, and, and Richard Bronk from the London School of Economics, Harjun Chang from the University of Cambridge, John Kay from the Financial Times, um, and Felix Martin from Thames Capital, River Capital. And uh, I, I think um, um, we've got uh, 12, 12 minutes, and I think um, we should maybe, I, I, I'd like to ask them, and maybe you'd like to, uh, do you have any comments to make on, on anything to add to what's been said? Or, or Rob, could I introduce the US? Yeah, of course. Yes. So the, the US committee is actually all here, too. Um, and uh, they are uh, Barbara Craig, Brad DeLong, uh, Kevin Hoover, Joyce Jacobson, uh, and Steve Ziliak. And I see some of you in the front row there. So um, please, hi. Um, so uh, please, have at us. Let's, let's, uh, let's have a little discussion. But of course, we're going to be around all weekend. So uh, you, you're, you, you can buttonhole us at any other, other, other moment as well. I guess we have to call on people ourselves. We don't have a moderator. Uh, let, I have to, I can't quite see. OK, sure. Hello, Andre Wilkins from Stiftung Mercator in Germany. Um, I was w just wondering why does the, the committee only have representatives from, from the US and the UK when INET has sort of a global vision? Wouldn't it make sense to include some people from Europe and from emerging markets already in the beginning? Well, we had to start somewhere. and. Um, We've got, a, we've got a panel of consultants who come from as many places in the world as we, um, as we um, could um, find contacts with. And uh, they've been feeding in the whole process. But I think uh, it's, if, 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 someone, if someone wants to do something in any of these countries um, and, and um, uh, under the INET umbrella, they're very welcome to set up task forces of their own. What we do at the moment is keep everyone informed through INET of what we're doing, and this has been one of the occasions to sort of uh, also do that. And, and we, we can't uh, bring in 190 countries into this process simultaneously um, under, a, under, a, under one particular um, uh, one particular task force. That's the answer to, to your question. Um, if uh, we, you know, there, are, I think there are one or two German consultants who have been feeding stuff in. Um, maybe I would just add add a bit. You know that that at least my view of what we need to do next is exactly that. Okay, that we started there, and for sort of accidental historical reasons, the Queen's question, blah, 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 okay. But now, now we can maybe be more deliberate and, 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 and more inclusive, and, and absolutely, I'm, I, absolutely. There's someone at the back, there's someone over there. Uh, Giovanni Dosi, um, I've got enormous sympathy, of course, to, to this attempt of reforming the curriculum. I think uh, that uh, behind that, uh, uh, inevitably, there, there should be an attempt uh, of uh, refounding the theory um, and refounding, refounding the general interpretation. I mean, uh, you mentioned Samuelson, and uh, it is true. Behind uh, Samuelson introductory text, uh, there are Samuelson foundations uh, that are sort of the, uh, the, the, the difficult uh, foundational issues are dealt there, and then uh, there is uh, the, the introduction that comes after. I think that uh, parallel to this effort of reforming uh, uh, the teaching, uh, an urgent task uh, is to basically take upside down the current economic theory ranging from uh, how people behave all the way to institutional and organization works and markets work, uh, all the way to uh, aggr aggregate dynamics. Otherwise, I don't think that will be successful. Mm. 
Um, yes, okay, I guess I keep forgetting. I'm supposed to call on people. Yes, could yeah. we, a microphone, please? It's coming, it's right there. Yeah. Hi, Doug Carmichael, Stanford. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, did you reconsider possibly resurrecting the ideas of political economy as a frame? And the second is, it seems to me that we want to have a frame that would be congenial to network theory and emergence uh, phenomena, that kind of new thinking and chaos and, and so on. And uh, so those are my two questions, whether you considered those. Can I answer the political yes, economy? Yes. We did, um, I, I, I like political economy, but um, there's a lot of resistance to it. Um, I think um, for some people it smacks of Marxism and um, anything that smacks of Marxism is obviously very suspect. Um, but I, I think it's a very good phrase that expresses, if, if, if correctly interpreted, expresses exactly what um, we're trying to do. I should say there's another meaning of political economy which is equally disturbing um, to people who want to reform, you know, some of the people who want to reform the curriculum. Um, but um, uh, if, 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 it could be, if it could be done without um, offence, it would be a very good restatement of what economics originally saw itself as doing, because it was called political economy um, without any of these um, uh, other, other connotations until the end of the 19th century. And then, as it became more technical, um, the political economy bit was dropped and it just became economics. That was the UK mm -hmm. development. I'm sure it was similar in America. I, I will add to that, it just again, about the deliberations of the committee itself. It, we sort of started, I think, with the idea that we needed more economic history and more history of economic thought. I think more people sort of thought that. Um, and that's in line with INET's, we have these task forces, right? Um, but as we thought about the curriculum, it seemed like just adding a few courses like that was not going to do much, okay? So we started to think about how to infuse the curriculum with, with you know, what, what is it about those courses that was important? Um, and how could we infuse the curriculum with that? Perhaps that gets to your point about, about, about political economy, but it was, it was also about different modes of thinking, different modes of, of uh, different kinds of information, um, you know, not just things that could be quantified, uh, that, sort of, that, sort of, that sort of thing. Um, let me call on Maria Cristina. Yeah. So we'll take turns. I'll call and yeah. then you call. That's how we'll do without without a moderator. Just a quick point. Uh, yeah. I am of course, as an historian of economics also. Yeah. I mean, oh, I'm Cristina Marcuzzo from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. Um, I'm of course delighted that history of economics thought has become you know, one of the focus of INET and, and your proposal. The point is that history of economic thought is not unproblematic. There is not one way of doing history of economic thought. Uh, and uh, I figure out that perhaps a little bit more discussion should be there how a course in history of economic thought should be taught in 2010, 2012. And um, I think the traditional way in which the, the subject was taught is one of the reasons why perhaps it was perceived as boring and, uh, you know, some archaeology and so on. So there are exciting ways of doing history of economic thought, and I'm sure that the panel should take this into, into consideration. You know, just saying we have to have a course in history of economic thought. And, you know, Aristotle and up to then when it ends, when the history of economic thought ends, Keynes or mm -hmm. Lucas. Uh, so it's not unproblematic. It's not something that one say, let's have a history of economic thought, you've solved the problem. Mm -hmm. You have just start thinking where the problem is. Okay? Agreed, Thank agreed. You. Agreed, yeah. Um, Jay, did you, ha have I got the right person? No, in the front row. Yes, yep, yep. Uh, Svi Bodhi. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't see. It's quite all right. Uh, I'd like to return for a second to the issue of uh, economists as dentists and usefulness in that sense, in the sense of practically useful. We are uh, witnessing all over the world, especially in the United States, 
a campaign for financial literacy, in fact, the month of April in the United States is being uh, regarded by the highest political uh, level, the Department of the President himself, Department of Education. It is a national priority. And yet I see nothing about that in this new curriculum. I think we need to make a connection, or you do, at not INET, between what the public sees as of critical importance, personal financial decision making, decisions about career, decisions about buying or renting a car, a house. These are all very real economic decisions. And in fact, the decision about whether to buy a house and how to finance it is what triggered this crisis. Mm -hmm. And yet we're not talking at all about how do we educate the broad population to make those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what economics is about? Well, partly. I mean, would any of our, our, our team like to comment on that? I mean, it's something we have talked about. Um, John, John, K, K, John who's K. the UK. I think we saw it as partly as part of what we described as mapping the economic landscape. And when we define broadly, and I think this is right, as the objective or one central objective as being not, I think, just to read the op-ed stuff in the Financial Times, though I hope people would, <laughs> but actually enabling people to read the Financial Times as a whole. Because it actually seems to me if that summarizes the current gap between the expectations that employers particularly would have of students who graduate with economics degrees and the reality of what students with economic degrees can actually do, it's the capacity to master that these particular tasks that actually makes that difference. Yes, that, that is right. I mean, we talked, this, this which, which maybe you didn't get that. Robert said it sort of in passing, but I think the committee as a whole, basically everyone endorsed this notion that being able to somehow engage with material at the level of, of the FT was a good sort of idea to try to, and that means bringing in knowledge of finance and accounting, putting accounting in the first, you know, there was basically broad agreement in our committee about that, okay, which is why our very short introduction was mm. sort of accounting and things like that. Uh, there, there was a, a lot of agreement about, about that. And if, I, if we didn't bring that out, you know, I, I, I apologize. Well, that isn't I yeah. yeah, I know, you're speaking more about personal finance, okay, and that, uh, I, I, hear, I hear that. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe we had a little macroeconomic bias in our, in our thinking Excellent. as well. Um, Duncan, do you have a, I see your hand's been up for a while. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to Axel afterwards. Yeah. Um, well, there's, uh, there's a little bit of an elephant in the bedroom feeling because uh, when you teach undergraduate economics, um, the issue of mathematics and statistics um, always looms very large. And in your presentation, um, there's a couple of um, boxes marked tools and um, items like that. But I think the, um, the treatment of mathematics and statistics um, deserves the same kind of thoughtful um, a mulling over and uh, revision, uh, particularly in terms of the spirit in which it's taught, along the lines of the Menand book, for example, that um, you want to give students some confidence without their fetishizing um, uh, quantitative uh, techniques. And we might want to think about um, ways to uh, do that. I think that also might require some substantive changes in the way um, mathema certain techniques are taught. For example, I think, personally, I think it would be a really good idea to uh, try to give up equal, uh, equilibrium in favor of explicit dynamics as a way of trying to think about modeling. Um, I personally think, I know I'm, this is not a popular view, that statistics is much, much more easily grasped from a Bayesian point of view 
than um, in, in classical ways of teaching it. But those are just ideas that ought to be thrown into the hopper and ground up by your, by your discussions. But uh, I, I don't see how a uh, successful economics curriculum can avoid this issue of at least giving students a confidence that allows them to defend themselves against a certain level of mystification and uh, um, intimidation that's associated with math and statistics. Um, well, maybe, Steve, former our committee, maybe you want to, we, we did talk about this, but it doesn't show up in our presentations, but, and, and, and Barbara and Kevin maybe have something to say too, yeah. Uh, Steve Ziliak. Yeah. It's, is it on? There it is. Yeah. Steve Ziliak, uh, task force member, U.S. and Roosevelt University. Duncan, that's a great question. We did talk about it, and I think the um, anthology for intermediate level students that uh, we're proposing, Reasoning Like an Economist, is a kind of book that will address these kinds of issues and teach the skills that, that students need um, to have empirical confidence. The first chapter, for example, or the first section might be on introducing data. Um, you know, introducing sure, data one is one of the most yeah. important yeah. things yeah. that a research scientist yeah. can do. You know, I mean, if we didn't have Madison's long sweep of, of statistics on economic growth, what would we know about the $3 day? You know, somebody would else would have to do it, you see? Mm -hmm. If Francis Amasa Walker had not been so um, imaginative when he worked for the uh, Census Bureau, uh, we would not have, well, mm -hmm. that would have had to be invented too. But who are, yeah. you know, you need a I skill set to do that. Steve, so the anthology, but uh, there's also, we, another thing we also talked about, uh, we called uh, Excel econometrics, yeah. you know. So, so instead of starting with learning about probability theory or something, starting with basic, you know, spreadsheet, on mapping data, manipulating it, uh, getting a sense of it, uh, maybe using some of these new, new technologies. That's what I was trying to show with that, with that beautiful recession graph there. Um, so we're, we're not unaware, unaware of this. I, I think maybe the better thing to say is we're not very advanced. <laughs> um, let's just take one more and then let's go to the bar here. So uh, yeah. Axel, you want to? Axel yeah. uh, Leon Hilbert, yeah. uh, somewhat retired. Um, I would like to uh, uh, throw a little cold water on the way I hear the history of economic thought being referred to here. Um, I think that uh, those courses died for, uh, not perhaps for a good reason, but for a reason. And the reason had to do with the way that uh, macroeconomics and microeconomics was being taught. Uh, they are, at different levels of simplification, they tend to be taught as sort of the, the current state of the art, the, the, what, we, what we have learned uh, today. And the current state of the art is taught as being correct the, and true until further notice. <clears throat> and uh, that way of teaching uh, uh, theory uh, automatically in the minds of uh, students and of most instructors turns the history of economic thought to sort of stories about the wrong things people used to think. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore it's not really important. Um, I never taught a course in the history of economic thought, although I've written a fair amount of stuff that belongs there. Uh, but I used to have a lot of history of economic thought in the theory courses that I taught. And uh, that used to be a distinguished tradition. If you think of people like uh, Jacob Weiner, uh, he, could, he couldn't do, do theory without the history of thought. Um, Lionel Robbins uh, taught uh, economic theory from a historical evolution, sort of an evolution of the way of, of uh, theory standpoint. And I think that's the way it has to be done if it's going to inform people as economists. Uh, I used to tell students to think of the history of economics as a decision tree. 
and you go back in that decision tree and you have to understand why the, the profession uh, was persuaded to go this way rather than that way. And if you teach it that way, the students also learn something about, uh, about theorizing as a creative uh, pursuit, uh, where uh, what persuades people to go one way or another uh, uh, becomes a discussion of the tools that economists use in making uh, these choices. And I think that's the way it has to be done if the history of the subject is going to be a live part of uh, uh, people's education. Um, could we just have Hajun, who's on our task force, just he seems to want to respond to that, so. <laughs> Right, I'm Hajun Chang, uh, University of Cambridge. Um, well, actually, the, I mean, we haven't fully developed it, but uh, we want to do something even more than that. We want to integrate the teaching of theory, not only just uh, with uh, history economic thought, but also economic history and contemporary policy problems. So if you are teaching moral hazard, you could teach them about, uh, say, the South Sea bubble, which uh, that, uh, led to banning of uh, limited liability banking. Yeah? And then uh, you could uh, bring in the Asian crisis and that, uh, how Adam Smith was against limited liability and Karl Marx was in favor of it and so on. So actually, you, you have to bring all those things together. You know, I mean, I, I mean, that, that do not do any research in the history of economic thought, but when I said boring, I mean, you know, the history of economic thought uh, course I learned as an undergraduate uh, student in the 1980s uh, back in South Korea was like, yeah, I mean, uh, you start with you know, the Greeks and, you know, I mean, by the time uh, you uh, reach, I don't know, McCulloch, uh, you run out of time and you, know, <laughs> you never learn anything interesting. So, I mean, th that is uh, something that we are very conscious of uh, avoiding. And ideally, I don't know how far it is possible uh, given people's uh, specialization, but Ideally, we want to bring all these things together, the theory, economic history, history, economic thought, and the contemporary policy problems. I think uh, we ought to thank break you. Up, um, so. if you. And I, I repeat, we're very interested in hearing uh, further pushing. And talk to me, talk to Robert, talk to any of the task force members who are all here. So we have a, we're, we'll spread out and, and take your feedback. Uh, thank you. Uh,